Welcome to The Rabbi and the Shrink. This is Dr. Margarita Gurry, CSP, Dr. Red Shoe, and everyone's favorite rabbi. Is that me? That's you, sir. Yannis from Goldson. <laughs> and today we're delighted to have with us Kira Day. Hi, Kira. Hey, guys. I'm so happy to be here. Thank you so much for having me. Hi, Kira. And I have a secret. Her thing is passion. And it's the rabbi who found her, which tickles me no end. So um, one of the things that I was excited about when I started reading about your stuff is that you have understood that one of the things to focus in on to make people happier and work better is the passion gap. So why don't you define that for us and then tell us how the heck did you get to this business of passion? <laughs> I would, I would be, it'd be my pleasure. So um, the passion gap started with my own gap. It's, it's kind of both, both intertwined. Um, and I'll, I'll get to that a little bit later, but really what we're seeing right now in studies done by Deloitte and Gallup and a ton of others that look at the way that we're experiencing work and how we're feeling about work is that 87% of people globally are disengaged in what they do. And what disengagement is all about is that they don't care about what they're doing or they don't care about who they're working for. And so a big part of passion is to care. So if, if we're not caring, then what is that doing to not only us as holistic people seeing as though we spend the vast majority of our work, of, of our life working, but what is it also doing to our work in the form of productivity, of, of really actually caring about the things that we're doing inside of the workplace and, and, and about how we're showing up as we're doing those things as well. So, and that affected me personally, which is what got me to actually starting to study this work as well. Um, I, I was just talking to you um, just, just a minute ago about a little bit of my personal history, but a lot of my work, um, at least growing up and, and getting into the working world was based, <clears throat> was based on changing my spots. Um, I, you know, my parents had a fire when I was younger and we, we grew up with a lot of financial challenges. So I was very ambitious. I wanted, I wanted to be able to break that mold for myself and for them, which got me into the career that I was in. Um, and it was a pretty long stunt, but that career was in sales. And I thought I was really passionate about it for a while, but what I became to realize was that I was confusing my passion with my ambition. And what that led me down was this road of just constantly driving forward with no actual real enthusiasm, but more of just trying to get to that goal, that thing, right? And that ultimately got me sick. And so with anyone, when you're faced with those types of life crises or, or getting sick, it forces you to look at the things that you didn't know to look at before. And I actually found a lot of my own health back when I started to really understand and hone in on what passion really was and why I needed to pick that path versus any of the other paths that I was previously picking. Well, that's good for you and good for all of us. <laughs> Thank There's you. so much in that story, Kira, that, that resonates, uh, you know, in, in, um, in, in the biblical narrative of creation, it says there was evening, there was morning, night was created before the day. And there's a tremendous uh, profundity in that that we live a life of contrasts. And very often we have to come from a place of darkness if we're going to experience light. And you, know, you said you came from a, a family that struggled financially um, and that drove you to be successful. I grew up in a family that was not upper class, but was very, very comfortable, upper middle class. And I wasn't happy. And so that directed me to look somewhere other than money. And, you know, that going into career and teaching, I, I sort of uh, <laughs> realized that, but, um, <laughs> you know, the, 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 the passions in our lives often come and emerge naturally out of the challenges yes. that we face. I, I say all the time, our pains become our passions. And there is this, and you, you, you hit the nail on the head, there is this beauty in that polarity um, that we experience, in that duality, because it's it's that contrast that we need to create the tension 
Um, and that tension is what creates the change or some kind of energy burst to really get us back in function into what I now know is alignment. And I never even had the vocabulary for this before, you know, so it really did. It, I, I did need to go down, go, go through that. And I am very, very blessed um, that I got sick. Like that, that was really the one thing, the only thing at that point that could get me off of where I was going into what I'm doing now. Well, yeah. I'm just putting in the chat, the link for the passion test. I think it's brilliant that you created this passion health test. And what are you finding? I mean, I think it's wonderful. You're giving people two things, an opportunity to think about things. And the rabbi and I both took the test and we had some interesting conversations about some of the questions and what it brought up for us, but then we get to have results. So tell me, what are you finding? Yeah, so this test came about very much by accident. Um, in the, <laughs> it really did, like honestly. In the initial days, um, I wanted to I wanted to see who my profile customer was, right? Because because what I do is I um, I help people that mirror my story, you know. So people who are stuck in um, in maybe a career that that they're just not happy in anymore, or it's not driving them in the way that um, that is healthy, and they want to make the radical change, but they don't know how to get there. So in the initial days, it was like, okay, well, how do I know? that people are feeling pain and they're not feeling passion. Like, how do I actually know that? So I needed to understand what were the drivers of passion. And I read a lot, I went into a lot of the psychological journals. Um, I started to kind of unwind um, what were some of the formats of, of what created passion. But to be honest, and maybe it's my research skills, I couldn't find for the life of me anywhere where, where we had identified what causes passion. I think Angela Duckworth in her book, Grit, identified that there were internal and external influences that come together, but no one was talking about what those internal or external influences were. So I literally started from scratch and make, made, making some guessing in, in my own like empirical way. But at the end of it, I was like, how do I know though that this equates to passion? Like that's, so I just asked a very simple question and it, and it's the question that you guys both answered at the very end, which was, you know, um, how, how passionate do you feel about what you do, right? Very simple. And when I first started to look at, you know, the questions and that answer, I started to notice something really interesting, which was people were really close um, from that perspective in terms of aligning the questions with their, with their subjective experience of passion. So I was like, okay, so this there there might be something here. So I started to tweak, and over uh, over some years, I got it to a factor of ninety nine point six percent accuracy with getting this subset of questions aligned to the to how passionate they were. So that was interesting. But what was more interesting is that when we asked the question. Um, or when we started to look at, so we went into some schools and, and corporations with this test. And, uh, and we wanted to know, is it, does it hold true when we get into the thousands of people and it did? But what we didn't expect, um, but we kind of had a hunch around was if they had higher passion health scores, how did it impact productivity? How did it impact attendance? And what we noticed was that people with higher passion health scores produced better. So they had, they scored higher from a grade, grade point average, as well as they attended more of the classes, which kind of made sense to me, right? Because if you're more passionate, then you're going to show up more because you're, you love what you do. And you're probably going to put in more time and more work and more energy and more effort doing that, which will naturally get you better at what you do. So those things started to really paint a picture on how important passion actually is when it comes to not only our well-being, our psychological health and all of that stuff, but also in terms of our performance and how we're showing up. So I read that you discovered like 15 factors or whatever that contribute to passion. What are those? <laughs> or at least well, the key ones. Yeah, so, so I broke them down into four main buckets um, and then clustered them because 15 is such a big number. It but is. What I found was that um, as a culture, the way that we talk about passion is very object oriented or task oriented. So if I say something like, 
I'm passionate about basketball because the language, because our in, in English language puts basketball at the end of my passion, our focus goes to that thing. So traditionally our model is, you know, I'm not doing what I'm passionate about because I don't know what I'm passionate about. Or, you know, um, I know that I'm passionate about basketball, but I'll never be a famous basketball player. So I'm, you know, I'm, I'm, I have to settle in life and do this thing that I could never find happiness in because I can't be this famous basketball player. And so we've got this very simplified view of what passion is, and we assume that it's this one thing. So I think it's very empowering that I was able to identify that it's about, it's about these 15 things. And as a matter of fact, none of those 15 things have to do with basketball <laughs> or have to do with this one thing. What it has to do with is the underlying areas of why you're passionate about these things. And if, if I could understand why I'm passionate about basketball, I could take that same formula and apply it to a million other things. I can get really innovative with how to express and understand my passion. So the four buckets that I placed um, these 15 things in is one bucket called internal. So your internal is are the things that naturally gravitate you to something, the things that you're naturally attracted to, the things that, that you, you naturally find important, that interest you, that you're great at. We all have this combination of these four to five things that, that really sparks our interest and make us come alive a little bit. That's one component of the four. The second component is our social environment, actually, the teams and the people that we're around and how safe we feel around those people to express our internal things, right? If we're unable to express our internal things because we're scared of criticism, or we're scared of, of you know, being humiliated or any other of those factors, then we're going to keep repressing them and suppressing them, which gives us no chance at experiencing passion. And then the third part is functional, which is how is your environment supporting your ability to feel, to feel safe, right? So there's people, there's environmental factors. And then the last one is psychological. Um, and Dr. Margarita, you, you, you probably know this one very well because it comes out from <clears throat> Ryan Dacey's work. Um, and it has to do with, with our autonomy, our mastery and, and feeling senses of purpose. Um, and when we're able to hit all of those functions, all of those, all of those sectors, then we're able to actually really express ourselves. Passion is about expression, right? But not expression just for the sake of expression, expression of our natural core, who we really are internally and how our environment has shaped who we are internally in order for us to feel that sense of, that's, that sensation of freedom. So if we go back to the basketball um, uh, um, example that I used in the past, if I put five basketball players in front of me, I use this a lot and I say, you know, if I were to ask each one of those basketball players why they're passionate about basketball, I can assure you I will have five different answers because it's striking them in a different way. One could be an, ex an example, and I've actually done this before, but one could be the example of, you know, it was, it was something that really created some, solid, some solidarity inside of the family when they were growing up. And it was something that the family would get together on and, and really there would, there would be a lot of bonding, which would ignite some really good positive feelings. So by the time you know this person reached of age, they would have gone into basketball, and it would have naturally have inspired some of those some of those things. For another person, it could be that they were bullied, you know, and when they got onto the court and people started to see their passion, they or started to see their talent, they could have been really kind of like um, a team could have been built around, and and it would have ignited a sense of belonging, and that's why they would have been passionate. The 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 combinations for why people are passionate about things are so varied and so diverse, but that's what makes it so beautiful. Um, and it's also the less, the thing we talk about the less, the, the, the least really. I'd like to dive into your basketball um, analogy um, because it, it really struck me when you, when you think about where do you see large groups of people demonstrating tremendous passion? The thing that comes first to my mind are sporting events. Yeah, or singing or or bands, yeah, yeah. Yeah, but but you know, that's an interesting comparison there. But but just to think about sporting events, I can understand people playing sports and being passionate about it. Yeah. But spectating is is a really peculiar phenomenon. 
<laughs> because what's it got to do with me? Mm -hmm. I mean, I live in St. Louis. It's a big baseball town. You know, everybody loves the Cardinals, and they're usually pretty good. So it's not too depressing to be a to be a fan. But what what am I doing? I mean, my kids actually got me into watching baseball. But then what happened is the players started changing so frequently that I couldn't keep track of who they are. And I, and I lost that sense of the personalities. Yeah. And to simply watch grown men hitting a ball with a stick, um, no matter how talented they were, it just wasn't able to keep my interest. So mm -hmm. do we look for passion in spectators because there's a gap in our own lives, because we aren't generating that passion internally. And if that's true, what should we do about it? That is a fascinating question. No one's ever asked me that before from a spectator perspective. You know what, honestly, it, it reminds me of like the gladiator days as well. It's just pure entertainment. Um, yes. of being able to live vicariously through these people that are doing things that um, that maybe we wish to do. It, it reminds me almost of the hero's journey, you know, and, yes. and watching and watching like narratives and movies play out in a way that that we're we're rooting for because psychologically on some on some level we feel a connection to, yes. to their journey and we are we are experiencing it as people experiencing their journey. As well, let me interrupt to interrupt you for one second because when you mentioned the gladiators, I mean. <laughs> I've been saying for a long time, we're living in the Roman Empire. Right. And the Roman Empire, they provided bread and circuses. They gave people food, they gave them entertainment. And this was the way of keeping the population passive oh, so dear. that the elite could live their life of orgies and, and excess. So, I mean, are, is, is that, are we in danger of that? That's very, that's very interesting that you mentioned that. And I, and I do feel like there's a lot of entertainment that is used as distraction. Um, and the more distracted we become, the less apt we are at looking at the things that are right in front of us. And that is the kind of society, unfortunately, that we're living in today. And I think the entire pandemic is showing us how disconnected um, we have become to just the social order of things. In Indeed. my Indeed, and we have become keyboard warriors. We're spectators over tweets. And I think that um, what you and the rabbi both alluded to is, I believe that many times we hide in our little desk chairs rather than fan our own passions and explore what is our sense of meaning. What can we do to contribute to the world other than add more vitriolic tweeting? Um, what can we do to make the world a better place for ourselves and others? Which leads me to a question. The rabbi and I were talking before you got on. Passion. Yeah. I see passion uh, in various ways. Talk to me about one-sided passion versus 360 passion. Ooh, can you elaborate on that? Or just one yeah, point? so I think some people say they have passion, but it's really just for themselves. It's only what they think and feel. Yeah, yeah. Well, I don't, I think that's indulgence, not passion. Hmm. And they may have a passion about it, but I, in my mind, and maybe I'm wrong, which is why I'm asking, um, I don't see that as passion. Yeah. I see that as someone being indulgent with their desires and with pleasure. And the rabbis and I have talked about pleasure getting mixed up in passion um, versus a true passion. I believe like you were talking about True passion helps people work better together, contribute more, uh, attend more, things like that. So please speak to one-sided versus the 360 passion. Okay, so to do this, I'm gonna break down my simple formula for passion. So my simple formula for passion is passion equals meaning times investment, right? Say that again, passion. Passion equals meaning times investment. So it's doing something that I find meaningful that creates that sensation of real goodness inside of my body. Now, there is two ways of doing this, and this is where passion and purpose kind of comes in. So if passion equals meaning times investment, purpose is passion shared. Purpose is being able to take that passion, that thing that I find meaningful, and share it with another person in a way that they find meaningful, and that transaction and by its nature is this 
super like value added combo. Um, and that can really set off just this positive feeling amongst community, amongst people. That's, that's what inspires good business, good relationships, all that stuff and good value inside of the marketplace. Um, but you're right, there is this component of how we and our relationship with our passion that can be considered eye-centric, meaning, you know, like it's for me. And I try, I try my best to, 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 to look at, well, what is it in that person's life that's causing them to want to hone in on this one thing for only them? Um, could it be these other factors that may be evolved, involved that we're not seeing? Could it be their upbringing? Could it be, um, could it be that they were you know, brought up to be in service all the time and not ever able to explore their own interests or the things that, that really drove them that's causing them to overindulge. Because ever, every time I see an overindulgence, it tells me that there's some imbalance that's happening in the system, right? So I'm thinking, you know, what, so my, my brain goes to why is there an overindulgence? But to be, to, to answer your question, there is this, there is this eye-centric component. And I guess that's just the whole nature of free will um, and people getting to choose um, how they want to experience and explore and express that passion. Sometimes people want to choose that it's for them and, and, and you know, it's, is that okay? I'm not sure. And then for others, they want to take that passion and move it towards more of the purpose line where they get to not only invest in the thing that they find meaningful, but they get a lot of pleasure in, you know, helping other people that will also find this thing meaningful. And like I said, there's a whole army of other neurochemicals that happens at that stage. So, and, and, it's, and it is a very, you know, some positive game that you play when you start servicing, serving your passion to the world. It's, it, it, it gets you on a completely different trajectory. And there's a lot of fear in that as well um, that people can experience. It's something very different to play for yourself than it is to play for other people. Playing for yourself can be very safe. It can it could be very um, satisfying and very safe, and you never have to confront yourself. But the moment you take playing in front of people, there's a whole step. There's a whole other um, growth that needs to happen for 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 that um, for that to, to show up and take place. Like I I say this to people all the time. When I used to sell for you know, Samsung Electronics, I was selling for another company. So it wasn't like I was, um, I, I never felt um, scared about that. It was, it was a job and, and I can go out and I can do this great job. The moment I had to sell for myself, there was something very different about that, right? Yes. I'm taking my passion, something that I care so deeply about and now I have to show this to the world and I have to deal with rejection and what if they don't find value in it? And what if this thing flops? Like there's a whole bunch of other things that starts going around that is very scary. So I don't know if I'm answering your question in any way, shape or form, but those are just my views on, on you know, the, the eye centric versus versus the, the 360 degree sharing of passion. I think it's great. And I have to say, it's obvious that the fear was worth the risk. I think you're nailing it. <laughs> oh, thank you. Thank you. So yeah. the advice you would give all over the place with the COVID going, um, playing all sorts of things in people's minds, there's fear, there's loss of jobs, there's you wear a mask, you fire people if they're not vaccinated. There's so many things playing in people's minds, right? So what do you suggest to employers so that they can remove barriers to passion so they can invite a wonderful, passionate workforce? Honestly, care more. Ah, how do they do that? I think traditionally we have created, I mean, and I, I don't want to generalize because there are organizations that do it very, very well. Um, but there are many organizations that don't do this very well. And we have been raised in this 
in this um in this organizational cultural dynamic where we feel as though when you show up at work your personal self is outside of work and we cut off the humanity so that we can do the task um, and when we become very task centric um, we can objectify our people and make them feel like they're just these robots there to do a job um, which again takes the heart right out of it and what you want to do is you want to put more heart in and the way to put more heart in is to allow people an opportunity and a platform to be people um, and also to get interested about their interests get interested in helping them to explore what's meaningful to them because where they may not see a connection to their job today, if you take them down that journey or you help a facilitator bring someone in to help and facilitate and bring them down that journey, they can start seeing things that maybe they weren't seeing before and realize that they are more connected to their work than they previously thought, thought that they were. And when you start bringing in and navigating those conversations, it changes the game for most people. I think underneath it all, people wanna be loyal. Um, we want to have community. We want to do those things. I think that the way things are set up environmentally, it makes it very hard for people to, um, to achieve that state of loyalty, especially if they feel like they're just a number or they feel like um, you know, they, they're replaceable. Like these, these aren't things that are gonna help create a good relationship. No. Those like, are soul killers. They are soul killers. And I say this all the time. Um, I don't know how it happens, it's it's probably you know been passed down for the past 150 years but and it's changing now and i'm excited about this change because there's a huge opportunity to facilitate this conversation in a more meaningful way but i've found that the relationship typically between employer and employee have been a very narcissistic one whereby it's all about the employer and it's never about the employee and it's like we think that that's okay by giving them money or giving them more money but that's never been okay. And it's almost like going out on a date and having to hear your date talk about themselves and then you <laughs> have it the entire time. It's never fun. But that's what we've done inside of the uh, inside of the employer employee relationship. And I think things are breaking down now and people are beginning to realize, hey, what about me? Like what do I get out of this besides the money? And I say this all the time. The way of the future and the way of now is that meaning is the new money. You're going to have to learn how to get back to that humanity and create more meaning if you're going to keep your people. It's just as simple as that. That's a great tweet right there. Meaning is the new money. It's a great meme. Yeah, uh, Rabbi, I like I'm sure you like have some that. pithy thoughts about all that she's been <laughs> saying. It's pretty impressive. I mean, I love the language you used, Kara. Um, yes. if, if you go on my website, you'll see one of my mantras, which is that ethics builds trust. Trust commands loyalty. Loyalty inspires passion, and passion drives productivity and prosperity. Yeah. And it's why I was so excited to have you with us. Because what is ethics? Ethics is an awareness of my position in the world, the impact my actions have on those around me, and taking responsibility for that. And when I take responsibility for myself and my behavior, and when I project my sense of purpose and mission, then that is naturally going to draw me to others who are going to be inspired. They're going to take that, they're going to want to be part of that mission. They're going to want to make, make me part of their mission. And that's where loyalty comes from. And when we're all working together, we become passionate. And a group of passionate people in pursuit of a meaningful purpose cannot fail no. it simply can't fail and so i think you've really um articulated beautifully uh, many of these principles uh, in a way that really taps in doctor wouldn't you say this is just fundamental to human psychology it is and i think that kira day has found a way to bring passion to the issue that's so boring how do we get people more engaged and productive and whatever the way we've been teaching it is boring um there's nothing boring about passion you even have a test <laughs> and i i think you know i looked at your website it is beautiful um i put the link for the passion test so her uh, business is the passioncenter.com 
uh, center uh, spelled RE instead of ER because there's more passion in the RE. <laughs> um, and I think that, um, I don't know, I'm very excited that you're doing this. This is a good year, this year and next year, 22, 23. It's a good year for people to look at their pain and redefine their purpose in life by looking at their passions and the pain that their neglected passions might be whispering to them. Psst, look over here, right? And um, um, this one is of my favorite philosophers was that, um, what's the name of the, um, Ellen, Ellen DeGeneres. She's one of my favorite philosophers. She does some amazing things. And one of the things she says is procrastination is a gift. Mm -hmm. What you end up doing instead of doing what you're supposed to do might just be something you need to pay attention to. Ooh, and, and I think that that's the gift of, like you were talking about your illness or car accidents or whatever. What is the gift hidden behind our pain to help us find our passion so we can make our world and the, the whole world a better place? So I, I think you're, you've nailed it. Thank you. Uh, before we ask for your final words of wisdom, Rabbi, I believe you have a word of the day. Um, I do have a word of the day. And I'll put it in the it's chat a, for everyone. It's a little difficult to pronounce. Um, I can't pronounce it. <laughs> Im, imputressible. Imputressible, which it comes from the same root as putrid. Why would we want to have a word of the day that has anything to do with, uh, with being putrid? Well, imputressible is the, is that, is not being liable to decomposition or putrefication, uh, which is another way of saying incorruptible. When, you know, why do things decompose? Because there's a lack of life. Mm -hmm. There's a lack of energy. And so if we lose our passion for life, our bodies may not decompose, although there are definitely health issues that will come from that. But more profoundly, our spirit can putrefy. Our spirit, spirit can, can decompose. And we can start making compromises in our values, in, in, our, in our relationships. And so what we want to do by preserving this sense of passion that, that you've inspired us to think about, Kira, um, we, can, we can elevate ourselves, we become stronger, we can become more alive, and ultimately we can become incorruptible. Because when I'm really passionate about something, I don't want to compromise anything. The question is, what are we passionate about? Are we making sure that we've, we've found a purpose, a meaning, a community, a vision that's worthy of our passion and that we've found like-minded people to support us and work together in, in, in developing that passion? When we do that, we will be incorruptible and we will make a, a tremendous positive contribution to the world we live in. Well, Kira, we're going to be part of your passion pod. <laughs> Perfect. Oh my gosh, Jonasen, that was beautiful. I could not say anything better than that. Like that, that right there, you've nailed it. Passion is the life inside of us. It is us. And when we can connect to that, we connect to ourselves, each other, the planet, everything just makes more sense. And I think it's the harmonizing of those things and that journey is, is what is the actual hero's journey, right? How do we get back to who we are and express all of it? And when, once we're able to do that, everything changes. It, it really does. You know, there's, there's just no other way I could have said that better. Thank you. You know, there is one thing I, I wanted to ask you though, Kira. Um, passion is something we generate from the inside. And yet we live in a world where not everybody shares our passion, where not everybody recognizes our passion, now, not everybody is interested in helping us live our passion. So, you know, if, if I have a, a brilliant idea, yes. I need to sell that to other people. Mm -hmm. If I have a, a wonderful service, I have to convince other people to patronize that yes. service. We run into the realities of the world. You were talking earlier about the internal and the external. Even if I generate my internal, 
I may start running into walls or obstacles in the external that, that can sort of interfere with the development of my passion. What do I do then? My goodness, welcome to the entrepreneurship journey. <laughs> That's, that is the entrepreneur in a nutshell. It is indeed. <laughs> I think it, it is, you are going to come against your, come up against obstacles. And I mean, I'm even coming up against obstacles right now. I don't think the obstacles ever go away, but I think it's that, I think it's, someone once um, painted me this, this picture and it was so simple that it was so brilliant. And what they did was they put this, they, there was three circles, right? One was a little small circle, one was a medium circle, and one was a really large circle. And they put the really large circle as your why, or let's say, let's call it your passion, right? That's the driver. And the, the bigger circle than the small circle is your obstacle, and you are the small circle. And your passion needs to be your self-belief, all of these functions of what, of what makes you you. Like, that needs to be so big, and you need to develop a muscle that's so big that you can see that even through the obstacles, that has to be bigger than the obstacle. If the obstacle is bigger than your passion, then you haven't done enough work on your passion. <laughs> like it's, it's, it's really as simple as that because life isn't gonna be you know, a, a skate in the park. And when we make decisions to live our truest and to, um, and to marry ourselves to what we're really here on this planet to do. And I do believe that everyone is here to do something. That is something that I absolutely 1000% believe and I've seen it. And I think, you know, it can be hard sometimes to fully express ourselves when people don't believe in us or when people tell us we have a bad idea or when people look at us and say, oh, that's too complicated, that'll never work. Or you don't have the right background to be going after that thing. Like there's a million different objections that people will have to your path but you got to believe in that path with crystal clarity um and you have to keep walking and keep making those steps and i believe that every time you make a step the universe will make a step or god will make a step whatever whatever word you have for this external thing that exists and is very tangible and we can't see it but it will make a step but you've got you've got to build that infrastructure within yourself and that starts at self belief um, that's kind of how I would address that. Well said, well said. Thank you. Um, will that be your final thought for, for us today, Kira? Or you want to add something to that? Um, no, I, I think, I think it's a, it's a gutsy move when, when people take what they really believe and when they move it in the world. And I think what you would find is, um, yes, there's going to be objections, but you're also going to find your tribe. There's going to be people who are attracted to what you want to do and what you're doing, and they'll see your authenticity shine in what you're trying to make. And I'm telling you, like, I've had angels on earth help me with this stuff. Like, there's no way I could have planned all of the things that have happened in the last four years. Um, they've, they've surpassed my own abilities to actually get this to market so um that's so lovely this magic that also happens along with the terrifying other stuff so um just keep staying your path and and you'll you'll yeah i think i you you will get to your own mastery that's that's what i believe as well well kira day thank you for inspiring us yes uh, thank you giving us the opportunity to show your passion okay. and uh doctor do you have a last word for us? Oh, I'm never short an opinion, as my <laughs> twin sister and I always say. The idea of passion for me is very exciting because with passion, anything is possible. The mistake that I see many people doing is that they wake up and say, I have passion, and they thrust it on other people. And then they let themselves be discouraged when other people don't say, yeah, yeah, that's great. Make video games in your basement. Yeah, 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 that's perfect. If we have a passion, a true passion, we have to have courage and we have to be patient. If we keep doing it and find those like-minded people, our passions will be realized in a way that adds more yumminess to the world and to our lives. 
don't give up. Don't get frustrated. You don't know what your passions are. As I always say, when in doubt, just pretend to be you. And those passions will show themselves. Oh, that's a good one. I like that. <laughs> that, that is my thought. I see too many people demanding that others support them and then blame others for not achieving their passions or their goals. No one's responsible for our passions but us. No. If we are joyful in our passions and gentle and loving, we will find those like-minded people and then magic happens. Like you say, angels on earth. Yeah. And I have no doubt with the way you speak, you speak so lovingly, you speak softly and kindly. You don't blame and shame. You talk about people's journeys in a, a lovely way. I have no doubt that you will achieve whatever it is that is the end point of each of the passions that you face in your life. And I'm sure you'll have many barriers that will only serve to strengthen your passion, just like for all of us. So that's, that's my final, final say, be patient and have courage. Well, everyone, it's been lovely having Kira Day here. Yes, snaps. <laughs> I saw you doing that. We will see you next week on, on an episode of The Rabbi and the Shrink. If you have questions for us, please podcast at therabbiandtheshrink.com. And we'd be delighted to address what you want to address. We have been grateful to you, Kira Day. Thank you for sharing your passions and the secrets that you've discovered. I hope when your study goes on a little further, you'll come back and tell us your findings. I will. I absolutely will. Well, please do. Please do. We appreciate it. Everyone take care and make it a passionate week. Thank you so much, guys. Thank you for having me. Really had a lot of fun. Well, thanks for joining us. Bye-bye.